The next talk is by Shalom Carmel, and we're going to start now. Our local time is 15.40, so let's get started. You got close to one hour. Close to one hour, that's too long. <laughs> we can have some little Mickey Mouse jokes and fill it up if you want. It's okay, I mean, I'm the one before last, so I guess people are tired and maybe bored and maybe sorry for coming anyway, coming to here at all. I hope not. Um, anyway, we're starting. Okay. Let's talk about one minute about legacy. What does legacy mean to us? Because legacy uh, is a uh, a term that we hear all around when, when, whenever we speak about uh, um, application information, uh, life cycle management, and when we uh, go uh, and try to integrate existing infrastructure into new applications, we hear the word of legacy. And I think that the second definition sums it up pretty well. A legacy system is an existing computer system or application program which continues to be used because the user does not want to replace or redesign it. Now, obviously, if I just put something in, a new information system, I have a brand new ERP system, well, it's not a legacy yet. So, sometimes at, 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 at its life cycle, at some point of time, uh, my application uh, will become obsolete or will will be going to be obsolete or you know at least when i uh, look at the legacy systems i can say that whatever is older than three years it may be very well be called already legacy because of the uh, all the crud that uh, and the entropy of the information that uh, goes in and of course if it works i replace it so legacy systems pose a huge uh, um, may pose a uh, problem to organizations because of the constantly changing landscape of technology. And I'm going to walk you through what happened to one such system uh, and what lessons can be learned for the future from looking at the system. And this system is the IBM AS400. What happened here? What happened here? Okay, great. The AS400, uh, now today called also i-Series or System I, is a mid-range platform that was released by IBM in 1988. So it's almost 20 years ago. It's a mid-range platform. You will find it in many places. It's uh, very popular in certain uh, countries like in Italy. Um, it has uh, hundreds of thousands of customers all over the world. It's not compared in a spread to a Unix or to a Windows servers, but you can count, you can, you can be sure that wherever it is used, it is usually a, a, a used to uh, hold the crown jewels of the organization, okay? The financial data, the uh, customer data, the logistics data, and it can be uh, used and it is used to run some of the uh, most successful uh, ERP systems uh, that are around. So what do we have in this uh, system right now, in, the, in this uh, AS400 system? We have a built-in database, which is basically a flavor of DB2. We have, we can write uh, applications written in COBOL, in PL1, C, C++, Java, RPG. We have an object-oriented OS. Uh, I will get to it later on. Remember this uh, object-oriented OS for a while. And you can, it, it is used uh, by many uh, organizations that already have invested a huge amount of money. Just to uh, make, uh, to give you the perspective, a AS400 that runs a business application has 500 gigabytes of disk space and has to support 300 connected, 300 connected users will cost not less than $100,000. 
Okay, so it's a huge amount of, in, of money. It's a, it's a large investment. So I understand the organization that buys such a system, runs its application on it. You know, even if you take an, in, into account the fact that after three years, it's already, uh, its value is zero in the financial, in the books. Still, I have it. Okay, the cost of placement is very high. I want to keep it. I want to continue to use it as long as I can, as long as it makes business sense to do it. This is on, on one hand. On the other hand, I have another problem. I have a problem because the landscape, everything is changing. Okay? I used to run a um, financial application on my AS400, so it worked pretty well. It was okay. Now, it's, it's sometime it, 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 in, in the um, life cycle of the application, uh, we decided we need interfacing with other applications. Okay, so we did all kinds of bad jobs and FTP runs. Okay, we have integrated it. But now I need it to integrate online. Okay, we're speaking about all kinds of new uh, ideas of integration. So this uh, is a, a major... Uh, <laughs> Um, it gave me a major problem. In our case, uh, I'm going to uh, walk you through a couple of minutes in, um, in, to show you what happened. It's, it's a bit of a history lesson, okay, so to speak. Uh, this system started out as a standalone server, standalone application. We had a manual driven application. You can see it right here. We had a manual-driven application. You can see here on the right side an example of a screen, green screen. It was, the, the system itself was connected to the uh, to dumb terminals, to green screen terminals with uh, Twinux cabling. Uh, at the outmost, we had uh, other uh, servers connected via an SNA network, okay, and it was all well. It was all well because I had application logic that was driving whatever the user could do, could interact with the system, okay? And the application logic was both masking the data from the user and providing a sandbox. Even though in this example, we can see that I have uh, there, there are those lines right here. It's something that says selection or command. So theoretically, a user could run a command in this place, but I could restrict him. We could say this is a limited user, so whenever this user was writing a command such as call program X, he would receive a notification saying, I'm sorry, you're blocked. You can't do anything that is not on your menu. Okay, it was really great and it worked really well for a period of, for, for, for a couple of years until things started to change. Now, what changed is basically three major technological changes that happened not in the AS400, but in the environment. First, but they affected the system. The first one was the appearance of Windows, of personal computing. Second one was the uh, uh, understanding uh, of uh, IBM that they need to take some of functionality of Unix and put it inside this machine. And the third one was the appearance of TCP IP and of uh, Ethernet networking as the preferred method of uh, corporate and of uh, business uh, networking. And what happened is that the old workstations, the old dumb terminals disappeared, the old SNA at Twinux network disappeared, and what we have now, wherever, does anyone come here uh, from, a, from an organization that uses AS400s? Anyone ever done anything with such a system? No? Okay. We have. Uh, whereas a couple of uh, years ago, up until uh, the uh, beginning of, of this century, you could still find terminals in some places and in other places, you had to buy specialized hardware to place it, to plug it into your uh, PC and to connect it with specialized cabling. Today, you can take just a regular PC, plug it into the network, open up a Telnet client, and voila, you're connected. So, with personal computing, 
we don't have a dumb terminal any longer. We have a smart terminal that may have, may run other code. It's not dedicated to this task. We have a new set of connectivity tools. If we had the sandbox in the beginning, uh, to start with, uh, uh, in which the user was limited to a specially, to, to a control environment, now suddenly, because I have connectivity tools that were supplied by the vendor, by IBM, okay, to solve a business problem. I have suddenly bi-directional file transfer between those applications, between my, applica my database and uh, the PC. Suddenly I can execute remote commands. I can run local commands on, on, on the PC and the users got out of the application sandbox. Okay, if uh, it were true, uh, but uh, uh, still, but there were no changes in the networking, then the problem would be, so to speak, controlled. Okay, I remember the days when in order to communicate with the S400, I had to buy a special card, a Twinux supporting card, plug it into the motherboard, and someone who didn't have this kind of equipment couldn't connect to the server. Nowadays, it's not Twinux cabling anymore. Now everyone can connect. It's not SNA any longer, it's ECP IP. And we see standard services ported over to the uh, server. Uh, uh, we started to see things that look trivial to you, that should exist on any server, but they were not trivial. FTP, Telnet, ODBC, RxEC, all of these protocols, all of these are currently uh, services that can run on an AS400, and some of them are very common, like FTP. Whereas, uh, again, a couple of years ago, uh, TCP IP was an optional feature that you could install in an AS400, and you didn't have to uh, install it. You could run it in your old Twinux or token ring service uh, network. Today, you can't ignore, you can't use uh, this kind of uh, uh, computer without TCP IP. Again, whereas you needed special hardware and special software to connect, okay? You needed either a, a, a terminal uh, and the card, or a, a specially written uh, and specially written software to use this uh, uh, Twinx card. Today, a regular uh, FTP client, a regular uh, uh, Telnet client, is uh, uh, good enough for it. Now. One more thing that is, uh, uh, complicates things even more is that when we uh, were working with the uh, applications, we were, we were having login screens, we were logging into the application, we actually we were logging into the server as uh, operating system users. And imagine yourself uh, this scenario. Imagine yourself that you have a web application. A web application is a really a, a, a good, uh, uh, analogy because we're talking about thin clients here, okay, basically. So imagine yourself that you, that you have a web application and you are given a user and a password to use in this application, in the web application. This user and password can be used also to log in via FTP to the file system of the web server and to log in with ODBC to the database, the transit. Okay, this is something that you wouldn't accept in a normal situation, but this is the situation with this system. Okay, once I have a valid user, a valid password, okay, to use it in my regular business application, I can use it also to uh, connect via ODBC with standard drivers or via FTP with the regular uh, DOS client that I have. And I can execute programs via FTP. There's an extension. If you connect to an AS400 and you type quote RCMD and some command string, it will be executed on the server. So what we see is the attack surface grows and grows and grows and doesn't end yet. At some point, uh, IBM saw that they needed 
to uh, support TCP IP and all kinds of services, and they decided to, they had, well, they had a, a solution. Basically, the same hardware is shared between AIX and the AS400, the i-series. It's called, it was called System I and System, or i-series and p-series. So uh, if we have, if we share the same uh, hardware, we can maybe take uh, some of the core of, uh, some of the uh, AIX kernel, port it over to the S400, use it to support TCP IP, to support all the services, and this is exactly, exactly what they did. As a result, what we see is uh, we have an, we have Unix uh, compliant environments running on the uh, uh, AS400 and two different file systems. One which is the old legacy file system and another one which supports Unix. Okay? Um, so again, we'll see some applications of this in a moment. Well, we have uh, two different uh, Unix environments. One is called the Q-shell. The Q-shell is basically, uh, it was uh, rewritten specifically for OS, for OS 400, for the operating system. It supports IPSIDIC. It's mandatory if you want to run any Java or any MQ, WebSphere MQ, which is a uh, successful message uh, brokering uh, software. And there is something which is called PASE or PACE. And what it does, it supports binary supports of AX programs. I can take, for, I can take a, any binary that was compiled on AIX, on one platform, place it on a file system in a specific place on the AS400 and execute it on the AS400, okay? So on one hand, I can take something like OpenSSH, port it over, which is good. On the other hand, I can take Netcat and port it over, which is not very good. Okay, and as I said, while QShell is mandatory for Java and MQ, Pace is mandatory if you want to run things like SSH, if you want to, if someone is, uh, uh, wants to uh, write uh, or create web applications uh, on the S400, uh, they must basically install Pace in order to uh, write uh, web applications. We also have uh, two file systems now. One is the root file system, which is just like any uh, commonly known file system that you are familiar with. It supports a hierarchical uh, folder uh, system, and uh, you can place in it, well, anything that you like. It can be uh, text files, uh, image files, JPEGs, Word documents, exe files, anything that you like. Of course, some of those uh, programs uh, that I spoke about uh, uh, that are uh, compliant, fully compliant with the uh, AX, also sit in this file system. And we have a, uh, the qsys.lib file system, which is a subdirectory of the root file system and contains access to the original libraries, the original objects, all of the programs. Uh, files, data areas, and whatever uh, exists inside the uh, AS400 libraries. I can move, we can also move things between those file systems, okay? So if I take, for example, if I have a, a, a what we call a, on the AS400 a save file, an equivalent of a tar file, an archive file, okay? We can today take it from the original library, copy it, to the uh, root file system, zip it, send it via email to another place, to another location, and then re reverse the process and recreate those objects so we don't have, we don't need to have any special protocols or any special tools, just plain common file manipulation uh, methods that we are all familiar with. Now, the combination of these uh, uh, advancements of these uh, changes, technological changes, that again, most of them, are, well, all of them, they don't originate within this platform, but were external influences, 
created some really peculiar things. For example, if we take a look at what is the program on the AS400. Okay, it is, so to speak, object-oriented, in which I mean that uh, we don't deal with files that I can copy and move around and manipulate on a binary basis when I speak about uh, the uh, objects. For example, I, I speak of uh, things that are encapsulated. As far as I can see, if I look at a program that was compiled on the AS400, I can see an object of type PGM. It has a set of attributes, set of metadata that are specific to programs. There's a shared set of uh, attributes between all, between all objects. Uh, and a program is created usually either by compiling source code or by restoring it from an archive, okay? And therefore the paradigm is that the file is a file and a program is a program. In other words, if I, if I again, if I look at the, uh, at the uh, PC world or the Unix world, I can take an exe file. It was called x.exe. I rename it to x.jpg. And of course, it's not a JPEG file, but it masks itself to be something else. I can't do it on the AS400, okay? I can't take a PGM object and tell it, now you will appear as if you are something else. It's something that can't be done, or can it? To call a program, traditional program, we see a, a do you see anything? Yes. I write a command, call, program name, parameters, and uh, apparently all is well. Now, I did a mini poll among not a very uh, large uh, set of people who are uh, developers, administrators, and experts of the system. I did it a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, the beginning of November, and I asked them a question. Suppose I ask them, that I remove, I have a, an AS400, okay? I remove the compiler, and I remove the ability to restore from an archive. Can I still create a new program on the AS400? Now, the question that I got, I asked 12 people, I got 11 people who said, no, it's impossible. And another one who didn't want to commit to anything, because he knew that it was, it, it was a catchy question. And of course, the answer is that it's not enough. Uh, the old restrictions are only relevant to the QSYS.lib file system. So what's stopping me to upload the Java program and to execute it? Now, if you can see, if you look at here, to call a program, on the a regular program on the S400, I do the call command. To execute a Java program, it's a different creature. It's a completely different creature. It's not an exe file. It's like comparing Java to exe, okay? They are different creatures. And what's more, so I don't have to compile it because I can uh, transfer the bytecodes directly from my PC to, that, uh, to, to, to the server. And I don't have to restore it into a library from a tape archive. I simply FTP the class file into the uh, new root file system and it's ready for execution. Um, on my website, which you will be, uh, uh, I will refer to you later, you, you will see the, uh, uh, the address again. Uh, I show examples on how to uh, execute uh, AIX commands, okay? How to take, uh, for example, uh, a netcat, install it on the AS400 and uh, create a reverse shell speaking to the server, or scan the, the, the entire network from the AS400. It's not, a, it's not a usual culprit, okay? It's not something that people are usually looking at. They, they think, okay, we have something we can run, we, can, we have to write in COBOL or in RPG, to execute code. No, you don't have to. You, can, you have other venues of execution. So, how are we dealing with it? How is the industry dealing with it? Well, the industry is mostly looking where there's light under the street light. They're not looking in the shadows. Now, what do I mean by that? 
we saw that we, for example, uh, created a very large uh, attack surface because of the, uh, all of the connectivity, the new connectivity was added to this uh, system. So what are people doing it? Basically, IBM has failed to uh, address this uh, and to provide proper tools for properly managing uh, access, managing permissions uh, to the system, but they did write exit programs, hooks, API hooks. They said, if you want to, you can write your own code. Okay, so there is a, a small uh, buzzing uh, and energetic sub-industry uh, of uh, security, AS400 specific security, that provides all kinds of security tools. But the problem is that they can only manage whatever they have hooks to. Okay, so not everything is hooks. If we look at the uh, DB2 connectivity, I can connect to the uh, AS400 from another server, I have two ways. One of them is via ODBC. This is, well, pretty much secured. But the, other, the second one is something, a protocol called DRDA. And ODBC is very well secured, so I can authenticate, I can, I can intervene in the process of authentication and decide if this user can uh, uh, log in to use, to use ODBC. Uh, even though uh, it's a valid user, I can decide that this user can't do it, but I can also track, audit, and uh, see what this user does. This is, but this is only for ODBC. DRDA, which is a standard way for, for two DB2, different DB2s to connect to each other, talk to each other, is not covered. So nobody's addressing it, okay, because IBM didn't provide the hooks. Another example uh, that I'm going to show you right now is uh, something which is even uh, more interesting. We started in an environment in which we had dumb terminals, okay? So when I have a dumb terminal, it can only be used to uh, connect to my system and to run whatever uh, applications uh, uh, are written on the, on the server. It, can, it only runs the terminal itself. When I have a PC, suddenly this PC is a general purpose machine, okay? So I can write, I can, I can on one hand, I have one window which is open to a, a client that works with the uh, AS400, and I will have another, another window that is open that contains Excel, okay, at both times. And gentlemen, we can abuse it because Apparently, what IBM did is that they provided a command called start PC command. And what happens when I run this is that, I can show in demonstration, you know what, best you. I can do several things. For example, if I uh, select this menu, this is a live system, okay? If I type one, one says all the new furniture on eBay. Okay, now what happens is that I have a new a browser a window opening up. I'm sorry, this is a slow PC, but it will connect to eBay. And uh, it's a great way to, uh, for example, to uh, create client-side integration, okay? I want to send an Excel to a business user and to open it from inside the application, the application menu. But I can do other things, other stuff. Okay, for example, no, not here, for example, uh, if we look at the, okay, Let me show you what happens when I run option three on the menu. First of all, we're going to look at the list of users that I have. Local users, okay, we see a set of users, of local users on my, uh, on my laptop. Now I return to the application and I type three. <coughs> Work with printed output. Okay, great. I work with printed output, whoever was 
noticed it, there was something happened, something else happened, something flashed. If I go now to the user list and I refresh it, I can see that I have a new user. It's called evil. Okay, it's a result of me running an application on the S400. It's a telnet, okay, it's a telnet, it's a, it's a goddamn telnet screen. I selected the... Uh, <laughs> And of course, on the S1 itself, I am in the uh, printed output. Uh, this is my printed output, whatever that means. Okay, let's suppose that I need to look at it, to, uh, to release it, or to view it. Some things that can be done about it. Okay, this is, I prepared an, an, an example in PowerPoint because I didn't know if we will have, if I will have any uh, network access. Okay, possible attacks on the client. This is a, a code example, a code sample that is, well, quite similar to what uh, I ran uh, with option three. First one is I created uh, a user, local user on the PC. Well, maybe I can do other stuff as well, okay? Maybe I can download some backdoor to the PC and uh, execute it later. Fortunately, we don't even have to run to execute, to, to install any third-party products because uh, when I use, I said when, because it's not necessarily, uh, not that when, if I use the IBM supplied, uh, what they call the client access uh, suit, which is uh, support for PC applications that want to connect to the S400, by default, I get something which is called iSeries access for Windows remote command, okay? It's optional, it's installed by default. It's, not, it's, it's also inactive by default. But what it does is provide an analytic daemon on the workstation. Now, all I have to do is run this. I can start the service, configure it to auto start, and uh, add this switch, the no sex switch, that basically says that I can connect, that now the PC runs an RxEc daemon, and doesn't require any authentication. It will run as the current user. And then I will run this command from somewhere else in the application or from, not from the application, from my own terminal, okay, because I'm the evil programmer. Run remote command, any PC, any PC command, remote IP I can uh, extract from the session, remote user none, remote password none, anything I want, I own the PC the client, okay? So we have an instance where because of uh, having a remote uh, smart client instead of dumb clients, we can abuse it. Okay, so what's next? With as far as legacy is concerned. Well, I have here a list of uh, four things that happened already Smart appliances, smart, cof uh, smart uh, uh, coffee pots. Well, I know that the time will come when the uh, coffee pot on the uh, CO table will order automatically new coffee capsules. It will be connected to the internet. It's not a threat. It's a, it's a security threat, possibly, but not related to legacy. Neither is a smart clothes, smart homes, or even uh, smart uh, uh, medical devices. So what is? I think that the next venue, the next uh, thing that will affect the AS400 and a lot of legacy, because this is only a demonstration of legacy problems, is that venue in which there, are, there is a very large number of three-letter and four-letter acronyms, 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 and uh, where uh, uh, and where people are talk about it, but don't know yet what it means. And this is the ESP, or the Enterprise Security Bridge. Enterprise uh, Service Bus, of course. But uh, I think when I look at, the, uh, at my experience in implementing uh, ESB and SOA in, la in large organizations, is the following. First of all, most legacy does not understand SOA, does not understand XML, 
does not understand ESB, does not understand work, work, uh, web services. It, it's Chinese to, this, to, to, to most of legacies, okay? You can't expect a legacy system to work in the uh, traditional, the, the uh, ideal SOA model, and that is to uh, have uh, its own SOA capabilities. It will never happen. Why would it ever happen? Because of sp over specialization. People, not only uh, in a legacy, but people everywhere, the developers don't know anything about security. Security people have never written a single line of code. Okay, system administrators have never written a single line of code. I work with system administrators who are really good guys. They know their work, but they don't understand how applications are written. And they don't understand how security can be implemented. So we have this over specializations which leads to something that I call cluelessness. Okay, they don't know. They don't know any, they don't know otherwise. When they don't know, and of course I'm not speaking about people who, are, who sit here, who we know, but uh, the people who will be uh, integrating legacy systems with the rest of the uh, ESB, the rest of the SOA organization, will be uh, people who don't really understand what needs to be done in order for it to work well and work securely. And the most important thing is that uh, the business wants to make it work first and secure later. So all of security problems will be put aside and we will have organizations which run ESB, run SOA as the main and business uh, uh, procedure, but with completely zero security. Any questions? Any remarks? Doesn't look like it, so. Okay. Thanks for the talk. We'll continue in 10 minutes and please give a nice applause to our speaker.